Okay, well, thank you very much for turning up. This is, as it says, rambling in paleontology. paleontology. I spent uh, 50 odd years as a, a geologist now, uh, starting way back in the uh, 19s, mid 1960s doing an O level in geology in England, which I failed after four and a half months of a two and a half year course. However, it got me, got me the bug. So this is peripheral visions, 50 year fascination with fossil vertebrates mainly, and other things, or the bit that Kenny didn't want me to put on there. Paleontology has its uses even to an oil man. And we'll try and touch on some of that. We've got a couple in here, I believe. Ooh, that went a long way. What happened there? Just turn it off again. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, while I was at university, I was uh, working with Mike Plain at the Bureau of Mineral Resources, who had uh, reptilian, sorry, yeah, reptilian and marsupial fossils from Bullet Creek, which I believe is in the Northern Territory. Uh, and this was a Miocene diprotodontid. I actually didn't prepare this specimen, but I did prepare several others like it, uh, including um, large birds and some uh, crocodilians. Now, the thing was here, we were using dentistry equipment, as you can imagine, we were using uh, vibro tools, we were using uh, picks, we were using hammers and chisels, and we were using uh, monochloroacetic acid, which is great stuff, because it removed all my fingertips <laughs> and made some of the teeth on some of these uh, fossil animals rather sharp. Something that I noticed years later with other uh, things. Now that should go. Anyway, the last year at the university in Canberra, I was working under, again, Mike Plain, who as one of my supervisors, on a 30,000 year old uh, fossil uh, location in a cave up near Wellington, which is well known for fossil marsupials. Uh, and the cave had been excavated, everything was nicely laid out. And the one thing that I could really tell you about it, it was full of large kangaroos. Um, nearly all of them had strange names in those days. I think most of them were probably Macropus Titan, which I believe was the forebear of Macropus uh, uh, Dulogenosis, which is now the West, the East Australian red, uh, grey kangaroo. So that was all good fun. Anyway, after finishing my studies, uh, I went on to look for a job, as you did. And about the only thing going in those days, apart from delivering soft drink, uh, soft drinks, was being a field hand. So. I was had a year in the Burinda Valleys looking at uh, hard rocks with various people and then ended up working for Ed Druce and other people up in the Canning Basin as a field hand, a truck driver and a cook and also the laboratory technician, which was good fun. Uh, we had to pick up uh, two kilograms of rock, limestone, every couple of metres and walk across the plains and up and down hills collecting this stuff. After a while, with 40 odd packets on your back, it got rather uh, tedious, but it had to be done. Now, we then put the limestones into a rock crusher, which was called Yum Yum after the Lord High Executioner <laughs> broke them up. And then we took the uh, broken up material, put it under, uh, again, monochloroacetic acid to uh, dissolve it and reduce, uh, <coughs> release the in conodonts and any other thing in there that was not acid soluble, which included a lot of fish remains. Uh, and then we ran it through bromoform, uh, cancer forming uh, uh, heavy liquid separation technique. So it was all a good fun thing for a bloke who had only lost his fingertips before, reading some of these wonderful things. On, the, on this trip, we also had uh, several other people, uh, Bob Nickel, some of you micro paleontologists may have heard of. Uh, Gavin Young, who was involved in fossil fish, and I spent a bit of time collecting with him. Uh, Phil Playford came up, and we also had John Backhouse, who many of the West Australians would know. So quite an interesting bunch of people. However, 
it wasn't all picking up rocks, crushing rocks and throwing them through the, the separation techniques. We also had some weekends where Bob Nickel and I, while ostensibly looking for uh, good samples to pick up, this was in Wingina Gorge within the Napier Range, the Devonian Reef Complex. Uh, Bob was really interested in cave deposits, so we had a bit of diversion here and there. This cave had a, uh, a, a, a Ferry Crete cemented conglomerate in it, and you could see very clearly the, the white bones sticking out of it. And this was about uh, halfway up the wall of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the gorge, way above the current uh, <coughs> river level, and it seemed like it was a reasonable age. We took a guess at that later on. But in this uh, mishmash of uh, partially weathered out material, we had three different sorts of uh, turtles. Uh, certainly, uh, Keelodina and the Caratagheelis were there, and there was a very much larger fragmentary uh, Keelodina. But the real jigsaw of the lot was the fossil crocodilian, which is up on the top uh, left, right for you. And we could compare that very clearly with Crocodilus porosus, but it's a much older species. Uh, you can see the correlation where the foramens for the teeth went and where the teeth themselves were. So this was all very interesting. Uh, <coughs> this was our field party back in those days. Um, again, these are misdated. It says 71, it was really 72, but I hate finding things like that in the literature. But it was very nice of uh, Phil Playford to put me down as one of the geologists, <coughs> even though it was the field hand. This is the one that really worries me. The other thing I collected on, on uh, during these traverses was anything that had a, a fossil fish on the surface of the rock. There were a lot of these samples, and I, I spent the weekends preparing them all out, and they ended up in Canberra, and I believe they've subsequently been sent to Western Australia, but nobody seems to know where. Uh, hopefully here somewhere, Kenny. Uh, Arthur and Ori would be asking where they were. Anyway, uh, you can we ask. did do some fishing in Geeky Gorge. Up there, there was also a lot of other interesting fossils around. The top slab is uh, probably uh, uh, loaded with uh, goniotites and the Virgin Hills formation and straight nautiloids and one or two other things. And then the other thing is you could, with a hand um, broom and a brush, you could pick up these beautifully preserved internal models of uh, cephalopods from the same area. No vertebrates here. But I did visit uh, Paddy's Valley, where most of the go go stuff, and Cleedy mentioned some of this stuff. The uh, top picture, I believe, is a uh, impression of some sort of crustacean uh, and also some uh, indeterminate fish scales. However, the other thing that came up in the basin, which has never ever been studies, studied in the eastern end of the basin around Villa Luna Homestead and Valgo Mission, uh, there are mid Permian Nuncanbar formation limestones which are full of fossil fish, uh, including a brain case that was identified, but nobody has ever described this. It's all sitting there at BMR in Canberra. If somebody's got a PhD there, they ever really want to get into Permian uh, fish. Oh, well, you do learn other things in the field hand. This was when I was out to the eastern end of the basin near Villa Luna again with Gavin Young. We went out to the Nobby Hills up here on the, on the top, and I ended up with two flat tyres and no patches and no radio. <laughs> For some reason, we were not given the radio, and I fought the patches. So Gavin said to me, well, John, I'm the geologist, you've got to walk. So I walked. <laughs> New West, out to the, I call it a highway, it was actually a dirt track. Walked down that, heading towards the homestead. I was passed by two or three cars who just waved. Maybe the fact I had long hair and a beard had something to do with that. And that was you know, nice, but rather frustrating. Arrived at the station to be met by the cook with a can of beer, which was uh, rather nice. It was Swan Lager. So the learnings that I came from this as a field hand, and also anybody who does field work in the middle of the desert, is uh, always check your toolbox for patches and have a radio, it's quite obvious. And 
carry more to drink than one can of coke, which is all I had with me on this 22 kilometer walk. Uh, especially, it was, okay, it was winter, so it wasn't that hot. Uh, and don't have long hair, and beer is good even if it's West Australian black duck. This is the sort of fossils we collected there with Gavin. I frankly am amazed at his uh, drawing ability because uh, on the other side of the screen there is what they look like for, in a photograph. And uh, I, I really take my hat off to his ingenuity there. He saw all these, these various bits and pieces. Anyway, they're all some sort of Bostrolepis philolunensis, obviously named after the uh, local station. And the other thing that got me was um, sitting there uh, in the, uh, the acid laboratory after going to Paddy's Valley and uh, Bob Nickel, who was a curious sort of fella, broke open one of the nodules that Cleggy talked about and found a beautifully preserved <coughs> Palioniscid fish in the middle of it. Now, God knows why he decided to look into the gut cavity, but he did and noticed a whole bunch of conodont elements sitting in there. And I remember him sitting there with his binocular microscope, little eyedropper dropping one little drop of acid, wash it off, another little drop of acid. Anyway, he, he found a whole bunch of uh, interesting conodonts. And there's, at the bottom is uh, one of those nodules that we collected. Um, now, part of the reason for showing this, apart from the vertebrates, is that uh, the conodonts, they became a large part of my exploration activity some 20, well, actually 12 years later. This was also in the Canning Basin. And on the, uh, oops, on the left side there is the conodont color. And as Dan Mantle will tell you, just like spores and pollen, they change color as you warm them up. They go from a, a light amber color to black and then to uh, white if you ever get that high. And Bob Nickel and again myself, uh, back in 84 decided we'd map all this out from all the wells and outcrop we had and it was very obvious that up around uh, the Fitzroy area, the Fitzroy crossing where all the known diamondiferous lamprolite pipes are, we had a very short uh, interval of these different kind of color indexes and strangely mm -hmm. enough most of the small producing fields are located within 50 kilometers of this Lamprolite intrusion. There are others that have to go on there as well. So that's sort of telling you that hey, we've got Miocene intrusions. They've cooked up the rocks, we've got oil and gas. So you don't have to go back and think, well, everything happened in the Triassic. Some things are there for other reasons. And this also works in one or two other basins. On the way home, uh, we stopped in at a uh, James Cook University. This is what it looked like back in 72. All the decent fossils were outside baking in the sun. I thought about doing a PhD here, but it looked a bit tacky, and I thought, nah, I'd go back to Canberra, which was also tacky for other reasons. <laughs> now, this is an interesting little slide. You might ask, why am I showing a picture of all the still living Apollo moon uh, walkers and astronauts? Up in the middle here, the supposedly the tallest bloke is a fellow called Harrison Schmidt. Well, what happened back in uh, 73, when I was working again as a field hand with, with uh, Gavin Young in the middle, we met Harrison, or Jack, out there on Goss's Bluff, which is a 142 million year old uh, uplift of a meteorite impact, and had fossil fish had uh, long been known from there. What, uh, what intrigued me was I was able to walk up to Jack holding this large bunker of the rock and saying, hey Jack, I think we never found anything like this on the moon. And he laughed rather than getting up and hit me, but he was quite small, so I was happy. Also on that same trip, we found a massive fish kill uh, at the, uh, up in the Stokes Pass. These were probably 99% Bothrioleepid fish, which are quite common in the Lake Devonia around the world. And this was a place you could actually get in with a sledgehammer and break all the sandstone apart and it was beautifully preserved fish. Uh, what you found here was that all the Bothria leafed fish, just like tadpoles in a, in a dimin diminishing uh, water hole, they all turned upside down, put their noses together and expired in a heap. 
And the only thing that didn't, because there were lung fish there, there's a lung fish dis displayed there and other um, uh, four-limbed or proto-limbed fish, they'd obviously got up and walked off to the next uh, water hole or a bit deeper water. So that was a, an interesting one. These are two uh, almost intact lofty leopards in the middle there, where you, the tail could be seen in the impressions. Uh, in 73, we also went, went back to the Marini Anticline, which was uh, at that stage and probably still is the uh, largest onshore Paleozoic oil and gas field in Australia. Uh, a lot of fish had been known from there all through the late Devonian. We found more again, um, and that's what the top uh, picture is a uh, ventrolateral plate from the Lophiolepis. And I went back there. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, in 73, in 83, uh, along the same trend. The other thing we did was looking for Ordovician fish. Now these are quite um, boring things. What you end up with often is just uh, things up here that look almost like um, graptolites, but they're not. They're actually fish scales. Um, and they're common all through the eastern end of the, the basin in the Steelway sandstone and also almost as far west as the West Australian um, boundary. The fish supposedly, according to um, uh, Wikipedia, look like that turn of whatever it is in the middle. And there's a lot of work being done on this, but uh, Mount uh, Watt in the south was the last bit of outcrop before you ran it into the desert and it might look uh, rather uh, warm there, but believe me, it was freezing. And uh, moving on from uh, those days, I got uh, a job finally as a geologist with the Bureau of Mineral Resources in, in, uh, in 70, late 73. In 75, I went with a bunch of structural geologists down to Eden on the southeast coast of New South Wales. And while everybody else was running around looking at the, the wonderful structures, me being a little bit bored with that sort of stuff, uh, got hold of all the kids that uh, the people had brought with them and said, let's go look for fossils. And everybody said, there aren't any. Well, I said, there's some red beds over there. But they just realigned the road. And we walked in and one of the young girls found a, a beautiful um, trunk armor of a Devonian fish. I found a bit more, and then later on they found some more. So it's, uh, I think, my first ever publication in the Australian Geologist. Back in those days, not only did they get various things wrong, they also couldn't spell my name, it being a foreign name. I was written up as John Carter, so if you ever go look for this, you'll never find it. <laughs> and I had a go at changing it. This, this is a late X specimen, which, uh, I don't know where the specimen is, but uh, for some reason I've got that in my collection. It was down, as I said, just south of Eden. Um, and as I said, uh, the location was on a uh, realignment of, of the local road, which has been realigned again, and nobody can find where the specimen came from. But it did give a, 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 an age date to, I think, the Twofold Bay formation down there. And uh, you can see there's a lot of other uh, locations down that way now. Um, in uh, 75 again, again, this was one of those things the government liked to uh, get you trained up to be a geophysicist for some reason. I was sent out to the Cork Fault in Western Queensland for a whole month to become a trainee geophysicist, which is unfortunate I never passed because I would have been a lot richer than I am now. Anyway. There were some interesting things around, the opalized gastropods and rhymatized fern impressions. And I found this uh, basalt hand axe sitting on a little uh, pedestal of sand, just in the middle, it was black, everything else was red from the, the desert. And it had been raining for a month and there it was. Um, this is a long way from wherever they uh, must have uh, mined and worked these sorts of hand tools, possibly into tribal trade. I got offered two cases of beer for it, but I kept the hand axe instead. Had to put the beer cans open some way, I guess. Now, also in 77, uh, Bob 
sorry, uh, Mike Owen, who was a micro-paleontologist becoming a field geologist, decided that he'd found some fossil uh, plant impressions up at Hatchery Creek, which is near uh, Canberra. Uh, the earlier section there, which is Devonian limestones, is absolutely chock-a-block full with many different uh, uh, Devonian um, armoured fish, which I say wouldn't be as prolific as a go-go, but pretty damn good fauna. So he walked up the hill looking to where Mike had uh, found his uh, plant material, and uh, I believe there was also a known um, uh, fish plate from up there and from the early 50s. Anyway, top of the hill called uh, Windy Hill, and that's not a coincidence the fact I'm a Bombers supporter, but there you go. And these were my original cards uh, made of that, and this one uh, was one of the anti-arcs I found. And uh, Gavin Young came back from overseas and thank God took over the write-up because he was the expert. And this is the reconstruction of uh, Sherman Aspis Hillsii, which is the, uh, the, uh, the anti-arc with a uh, spine. So the other thing was everything up there was red and conglomeratic, Hatchery Creek conglomerate. And also there was these little black um, pods, which are obviously uh, cutoffs within within the fluvial system, and in that we found many many fish plates, lots of stuff that had never been seen before, and little nodules of limestone, which we thought, wow, this will tell us something. Sent them off to, to Bob Nickel, put them through acid, and we've got a lot of theolith on the scales, which told us we're in somewhere in the uh, the early Devonian, uh, but it's obviously younger than the carbonates, and this was. Uh, one of the ones that I came up with, I called it Diopticius australis, and uh, sorry, Kitty, we had to show this for your name. Um, it's now supposedly related to Canicthus, which is only known for the Emsian in China, and it's supposed to be one of the, well, probably the oldest known uh, ancestors of tetrapods. This one here from the uh, Hatchery Creek is potentially slightly older, so I'm told on good authority, um, which would be nice. Again, Australia leads the world in crawling around on the uh, land. And uh, some of Gavin Young's students went back and they've now got about 30 or 40 localities in there, not just plants, but also fish. And they were so kind to actually name this one and only uh, specimen after me. That means it will disappear in the in the, in the distant past or distant future because somebody will change the name. But anyway, it was very nice to be rewarded. So then back to the Amadeus Basin. In 83, I was drilling wells uh, just on strike down from the Rooney Anticline in the Walker Creek Anticline. And you know, drilling wells is not a full-time business. Every now and then they've got to do something, maintenance or whatever. So you go for a walk. And I went for a walk down the Walker Creek Plain and Oh, well, let's look for fish, and lo and behold, more fish. This fish locality is apparently the youngest one in the park siltstone, which means it's, it's still in the, uh, the late Devonian, but it's a little bit younger than uh, uh, some of the stuff that have been discovered earlier on. So there seems to be a whole sequence of different fish fossil locations coming up through here. And on the on the on uh, this side of the screen, you can see that up to uh, the paper published in 87, there were nine different localities known, spanning somewhere from down in the Marini, which may be uh, Devonian or even late Silurian, up into the, uh, below the Hermansburg, which is the late uh, part of the Devonian. However, this story is about number 10. Number 10 was in 87, I got, or 86, I got a little bit um, intrigued because I was looking at the Kuta sandstone as the main reservoir in the, the Amadeus Basin. And Peter up there knows all about that. But this, one minute, we're not going to finish. Um, <laughs> at, at this locality, there was uh, the Nadala member, which was well known as a glauconitic green sand deposit that uh, probably was part of the Kuta sandstone. So I went and have a look, and it had nice little nodules of limestone in it, so we had those looked at, and lo and behold, we had theolodonts. Maybe not the same, but 
pretty much the same we saw in the Hatchery Creek, at least for the seal of not um, part of it. And we also had other strange things like um, conodonts from the middle of the Cooper sandstone, which is also full of vulcanite. So that was all reworked, especially if the thelodonts are in place. I mean, it was Devonian sediment. But we also had earliest Cambrian um, mollusks. So there was so much in this one, lo one location, all this reworked material. And that only meant uh, about an 80 million year change of the, uh, the location of the Ndala member, which suddenly went from somewhere in the Ordovician, basal Ordovician, up into probably the early Devonian. And that uh, has never really been factored into uh, anybody's understanding, uh, apart from this one paper published in 87. Uh, the other thing was conodonts, have to bring these up again. They were useful in this place. We collected limestones all over the basin and wells and also outcrop and were able to map, this is a, a section of the top of various wells showing the different conodont colour indexes and it's interesting that we are seeing conodont colour about one and a half to two where the oil is and the, when we get deeper than that into Palm Valley field with CAI as a three we're looking at dry gas. That's quite indicative, and we won't bother about the chart. So we mapped it all up, and the, the, it tells you quite clearly that there are zones where you can map the one to one and a half, which is barely mature, the one and a half to two, which is the oil mature, and two plus, which is uh, gas mature. And we ought to come up with a map showing where we would predict oil, oil and gas, and possible wet gas, and there was no prospectivity. We didn't drill this damn well, but it was very close to one we wanted to drill, but weren't allowed access. We did find oil in, in Mount Winter, number two, and uh, Central Petroleum found oil and gas as a surprise, nicely named well. So that vindicated the study there. Uh, well, we're about that. That was the hour in Dasper I found that never published. Oh, that was a story too. That was uh, offered to Al Sharinga, and they said, you're one word too long to fit on the one page. Can you get rid of that one word? I said no, so it's never got published. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just threw this in for seismic. It's a very old seismic line. Uh, east is that away, where it says north. Sorry, north. And you're seeing here quite clearly that all the, uh, the last fill, the Perth and Jara group, is unconformal on the Ordovician and Cambrian in the, uh, the northern part of the basin, and down south it's pretty much uh, conformal. This is just to show you that uh, the seismic actually agrees with the paleontology, not the other way around. And here's another example through uh, Ellery Creek, which is a beautiful section. Uh, again, Peter did his thesis on this one, I believe, Peter Haynes. And we know from uh, work that was done by various people that uh, the Conodon colours up here in the Bakuda and within the Horn Valley, that one mentioned OH, uh, which are around about one uh, immature on the outcrop. Uh, those same fossils are reworked down into the, the last deposit where they still have a kind of color of one immature. And on this outcrop here, I was, which is up in the, uh, the molass as well, uh, you can see very large straight nautiloids, I'm talking things this big, reworked into this uh, conglomeratic sand. And I so, uh, collected some of those, set them off, and we got a whole bunch of interesting conodonts out of those sitting up here on the, on the top uh, slide, again with a conodont colour of one. Now the interesting thing about all this and the reworking, and that's shown on the other side of the slide there, you can see we have uh, Kuta sandstone sequence two and sequence three reworked right into the, the top of the Devonian, and we have the Horn Valley reworked into a sequence that was lower than that. This is a reverse sequence. You're getting compression, everything's been pushed over and dropped into the depot center to the south of the what is the McDonald Ranges. This, this map which I stole from uh, the Northern Territory Mines is interesting because all those yellow blobs are where people uh, saw uh, these last deposits. A lot of them, the Runyurite trough down in South Australia, most of the Amadeus except the south, uh, and, and the Georgina Basin all have fossil fish in them. And that means that if somebody went to the Arunta, 
uh, sorry, to the Narlia Basin and up in the land of trough, good chance you're going to find a bunch of uh, Devonian fish. And just to round it off, uh, fossil fish became quite sparse in my in my uh, geological career after this. However, in uh, mid-2005, uh, Rob Nicol was sent a whole bunch of uh, limestones with cuttings from some deep uh, marine uh, west uh, Exmouth Basin, Exmouth Plateau wells. Uh, they, were, they were known to be foraminifera and others in there. And I'm sure uh, Dan up there is an expert on the, the late Triassic palynology. But there's all these fossil fish teeth in there. And again, nobody's ever followed this up. Probably not a PhD, but there could be something interesting in that. Anyway, I think that's pretty much it. Just to finish up showing I'm still interested in fish, crocodiles, and well, a very dead tortoise. <laughs> I think that is it. Thank you, John. Uh, we are only half a minute.